Hello, and welcome to another episode of Climbing on the Bookshelf. It's been a couple of months since I published another episode, but with one thing or another and work, I just haven't quite got round to it. So to all of you that are still hanging on and are listening now, thank you very much. I thought you'd all like to hear my chat from one of modern climbing literature's renowned writers and editors, Katie Ives. I was absolutely thrilled when we fixed a date to chat. To be honest with you, I still, after two years of doing this podcast, get really nervous. So back in 2021, while still working at Alpinist, she released her first book, The Riesenstein Hoax and Other Mountain Dreams. It covers the infamous hoax about a fake mountain range in British Columbia and the pull of blank spaces on the map and the role of imagination in climbing. It also covers other legends, folklore and fiction from around the world, including Xanadu, Nanda Devi and the Aboriginal Dreamtime are just a few. So, if after you've heard Katie talking about the book and you like the sound of it and want to know more, then order yourself a copy. There's a few links in the show notes of where to get it. Particularly if you're in the USA, then Mountaineers Books in Seattle is the place to go for it. They're a non-profit organisation, so it'd be really great to support them. Their site is mountaineers.org and you can find it on there. If you're in the UK, then Little Peak Press stock it too. Those of you that have listened to my past episode with Heather Dorr called Finding Time, she runs that publisher and it would be great to support her too. The website is littlepeak.co.uk. So, I really hope you enjoy this one. All of a sudden it started working now. I don't know if you could hear me before then. No, I couldn't hear you. I thought, oh, right. Well, I thought- I thought because you said it's seven o'clock your time that we yeah. should start. I thought maybe you hadn't joined yet. And I was like, so then I left and then I rejoined. Okay. How are you? All right. Pretty good. Yeah. How are you yeah. doing? Yeah, very well. Quite nervous, but great to talk to you. Um, a, a kind of celebrity in climbing writing, as far as I'm concerned Yikes. anyway. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, I've been good. Yeah, I've been. Um, hmm, I don't know. Where do you start? Um, yeah, I've just been uh, balancing a lot of projects re- lately and working on um, editing some books, working okay. on writing a second book. And, okay, uh, great. Writing great. some articles. And, yeah, you know, sure. Get out in the mountains when I can. Yeah, I've, I've been I've been seeing you, your um, sort of social media posts and things and, and I, I really like all the scenery and things that you take a picture of. I think it looks great out there. I'm quite jealous because I just live in the UK and there's rubbish mountains apart from Scotland, but I'm the other end of the country, so um, I don't get up there as often as I should, really. But from what I've seen, it looks beautiful out there. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, I'm living right on the edge of the flat irons. I can actually see them from my window right there. Sure. Partly hidden by a mist of snow. Um, so, yeah, I'm within walking distance of wa- of rock climbing, um, short driving distance to backcountry skiing and ice climbing and other places. Well, thank you for your time. I really appreciate um, you coming on, climbing on the bookshelf. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, So maybe we could start, or maybe you could start by telling me what you've been up over, uh, what you've done the last few weeks. Um, I'd love to know if you've got any sort of plans for more ice climbing. Oh, well, the past few (laughs) weeks, um, I actually had a shoulder injury, so... (laughs) I've been doing okay. a lot of working the past few weeks. <laughs> sure. Okay. I've been doing a lot of trail running. I yeah, I did get out for a little bit of easy rock climbing, which uh, the okay. physical therapist I'm seeing just says easy is grades. Yeah. So okay. I'm waiting to get my for my shoulder to recover for anything more exciting than. That. I'd love also love to know um, and my listeners too um, how you got into your role of editor in chief at Alpinist. So. Yeah like a sort of timeline of your journey and learning and the the rise to the top of one of the best climbing magazines yeah well um it was quite an adventure um you know i guess it kind of started for me well i I was always interested in mountains um ever since i was a child um and you know as i talk about in the book uh, growing up in the lowlands of eastern Massachusetts, I used to have these recurring dreams of an enormous mountain that was like rising through the farm fields and okay. soaring into the sky with you know snow and cornices and, and glaciers. Um, finally, when I, I grew up, I was able to <laughs> leave Massachusetts, okay. and, um, head west and north to um, see 
real big peaks. Um, and I, I realized partway through graduate school that climbing was really the main thing that I wanted to write about. I had been casting about for subject matter for some time and I was getting an MFA in fiction at the University of Iowa. And uh, there was just one particular day when I went out rock climbing with a friend and you know, I still remember just the, the pale November sunlight and the way that um, the fossils glittered on the cliff and this feeling of luminosity and weightlessness um, that stayed with me. And I think afterwards, I, I began to realize that there was something inherently about the nature of climbing that lent itself to writing, that it helped me and helped other people attain that flow state creativity and um yeah and it sort of helped i think helped me sort of access my unconscious my imagination um and it became very intertwined with what i was trying to do as a writer so so i began looking at climbing magazines that i could write for since climbing seemed to be the main thing I'm writing about and that was when i learned that albinus had an internship and i was in my late 20s at the time and I had just gotten my graduate degree and I called them up and said I was interested in applying for an internship, but I was a little bit on the older side of interns. Okay. And, you know, they were like, well, you know, send in your resume. So I sent in my resume and they got back to me and they said, well, you're, you've got a master's degree. You're, as it so happens, our copy editor has just quit and we need a new copy editor. How would you like to be the copy editor? And I said, well, I actually have no editing experience at all. So I'm not really sure I'm qualified. Um, but, you know, I'm still interested in the internship and I really admire your magazine. I'd sure. be, you know, honored just to make coffee for you. Um, <laughs> and uh, little did I know I would be making coffee for the staff for years afterwards. Um, but that's another story. Um, any rate, uh, yeah, so they got back to me again in a few weeks and they said, well, we really need a copy editor and, you know, we'd really like to um, have you come on board at the magazine because of your background in writing. Yeah. So why don't you learn how to be a copy editor and then you can be our copy editor. Um, so I went out and bought a copy of the uh, Chicago Manual Style and I did my best to memorize it and I became the copy editor. Sure, that's that's very brave of them, isn't it, to, to, to do that for somebody they don't really don't really know. To yeah, kind of train so them I, up I worked, and yeah it was it was brave and it was of course an incredible opportunity for me um, so i worked remotely for them that autumn because i was finishing up a semester of teaching at a local community college and then uh new year's eve i i drove out to jackson wyoming uh, arrived in the middle of a horrific snowstorm and uh began work there in in early january and um, discovered pretty quickly that editing was something I was really passionate about. I hadn't realized. And I think, you know, that extraordinary experience of being able to work that closely with another writer, to observe someone's creative process, um, to help them take a draft that's rough and possibly chaotic and sort sure. of see those underlying patterns and see see those sort of structures of meaning beyond it um you know it's 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 a really magical experience it became a really important one to me and a, and and so a great I, great yeah. setting there as well yeah with the tetons there as well yeah yeah the tetons are amazing i was you know i had while I was in Iowa, I learned to lead rock climbs and I'd done a bit of ice climbing up in Wisconsin and and northern Iowa. We went out and climbed. Um, it was the university there. They they create ice climbs on giant grain silos. Um, so I've done okay. a bit of ice climbing uh, in a rather unusual circumstance. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, getting out to the Tetons and, you know, actually being able to do alpine climbing for the first time was nice. Was a yeah. Great. And what, what did you like most at, at Alpinist once you were sort of fully settled in and, and thought, yeah, this is, this is the career that I'm going to stay with? Yeah, I mean, there were a number of things, you know, as I sort of touched on before, I think that that experience of working so closely with writers and helping yeah. them find their stories and find their voices um, and, and sort of helping them realize that they had potential within them that they weren't necessarily aware of before. Um, I think I became 
so keenly aware of just the fact that every human being has an important story to tell. Everybody has these realms of meaning and possibility and beauty and wonder within their minds. You know, climbing stories, because that was something I seemed to have a knack for editing, that was kind of my way to help people. And that was my way to help them access those worlds of imagination. And then, you know, I also, you know, I loved putting together a magazine. I think, you know, I think one of the wonderful things about print is, you know, you're not just publishing single stories that appear in somebody's newsfeed on, you know, social media or whatever. It's you're creating an entire world within these books and you're juxtaposing yep. stories together and you're able to make something that's really a work of art that's immersive, that invites the reader in. And, um, you know, I think increasingly over time, I'd always enjoyed working with beginning writers and emerging writers. I think increasingly I became very interested as um, more and more women started entering the field, as more and more writers of color started entering the field, indigenous writers, black writers, and the, being able to be in a position to help amplify those voices and to mentor new writers and to kind of see help them in their journey towards really recreating the landscapes of mountain literature. So with most things now, it's um, sort of online, so and it's so easy to access them. It only seems a handful of actual published paper magazines. Where, where do you think the climbing magazines are headed in the future? Do you think they'll slowly dwindle out or do you think there'll be like a handful that kind of that everybody goes to when they actually want to feel a, a a magazine in their hand. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to know. I would say, you know, from my very first day of working at Alpinist in, at the office um, in January 2005, you know, I knew that the magazine was in peril. Um, I knew that pu- I learned pretty quickly that publishing yeah. was a precarious career to have chosen. <laughs> um, so I'm very used to doom and gloom. Um, okay. You know, people been saying print is dead for a very long time sure um when the original owners of alpinist went bankrupt in 2008 and the new owners purchased the magazine and relaunched it as a print magazine in 2009 you know people are saying print is dead you know why are you doing this you're just gonna lose your money and you know well they didn't make any they haven't made any money off of alpinist but they've managed to keep it going so was it was it michael kennedy that took over and brought it back in was that right Michael Kennedy took over as editor in chief in 2009. Um, okay. The owners of the magazine are a publishing group based in Vermont. So, kind of coming from that atmosphere of having heard these sort of pronouncements of, you know, apocalyptic horror for the yeah. night, ever since I began my career, yeah. you know, it's hard to know when it's like if things are really bad as they as they might sometimes seem to be. I mean, certainly, you know, the the loss of rock and ice, demise of climbing. Sp- Climbing is a print publication. I mean, those were all really heavy blows. Um, you yeah, know, I think there are a yeah. lot of people who are really sad about that, myself included. And, you know, there's a lot of people who are worried about the future of publishing. You know, on the one hand, you have advertisers who are increasingly unwilling to support independent media because they produce their own media. You know, it's like, well, buy an ad to help Alpinist stay in business or to help Gripped Magazine stay in business when, you know, those pesky independent journalists, you know, they might investigate my company, you know, so yes. you know, why not just like, you know, publish propaganda on my own site and, yeah. you know, get, you know, reach consumers directly that way. So you have that kind of thinking where you, there's a mat decline in ad revenue, which is, which is definitely okay. affected independent media companies. Yeah. Um, and then also, you know, you have readers increasingly accustomed to getting content for free online so you know it's like publish really Mm -hmm. in-depth quality journalism you really have to be able to pay writers you have to be able to pay fact checkers you have to be able to pay editors because this is full-time work um you know this isn't something you can do sort of as a hobby you know yeah that that's that's a it's a huge concern um that's also a concern because there's so many great writers entering the field and you know we're sort of I feel like in many ways we're on the cusp of what could be a real golden age of mountain literature with the increasing numbers of talented new writers, the increasing diversity of new writers, the increasing willingness to be experimental, to talk about topics that were avoided in the past, 
um, try new forms to use poetry or um, art. You know, I think there's there's so much potential out there, but that potential needs financial support. Magazines and and book publishers and you know other people who pay writers and who pay artists and who pay photographers they need to be able to stay in business. Um, so I think it's yeah it's 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 definitely an uncertain time. I think for in terms of like readership you know i think there's always going to be particularly among climbers there are always going to be those readers who enjoy yes. print um yep. because yep. climbers like to touch things you know they like they like they're very tactile they yes yes yeah um you know and they like to collect things and they they like to have something beautiful to put on their shelf i know, can agree with that yes yeah definitely with your with your uh, podcast title um so once you um settled yourself into editor in chief of alpinist um you were there for a few years was it 10 years was it maybe so i was at alpinist for nearly 18 years total 10 of those years a little more than 10 of those years i was editor in chief i started being editor in chief in may 2012 and i left the magazine in august 2022 what made you make that move to step down from the magazine yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I'd always sort of imagined that I'd stay at Alpinist forever and that this was, you know, I'd found my spiritual home and, you know, that I'd, you know, it was the perfect job. It was the only job for someone like me. Um, and, uh, you know, there'd been a series of budget cuts, staffing cuts, and I was seeing my hours creep up to 80 hour weeks again. It just felt like, I don't know how, if this is going to be sustainable forever. You know, my, my parents are getting older. I'm getting older. Am I still going to be able to work these kinds of hours in 10 years? Or is it to kind of think about, you know, a way to find a 60-hour work week instead? Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, start winding down a bit. To... I'd like to, if it's okay, um, move on to climbing literature. So when did you discover that you enjoyed reading this genre and what did you love about it? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, I'd read, you know, I definitely read some climbing books when I was younger. Did you read all um, the classics and things? No, I didn't, not until much later, because I didn't really get into climbing until my late 20s. So I came across a few stray books here and there when I was growing up. And, you know, I always, I loved going hiking in the mountains. And I loved reading books that had mountains in them. You know, even okay. if these were fantasy books, like, you know, Lord of the Rings. Um, but yeah, I think I really started reading mountain literature more intensely as I got into climbing my late 20s and as um, I started working at Alpinist, of course, I was reading quite okay. a lot. <laughs> um, at one point, Banff invited me to um, moderate a panel on the best mountain book ever written, which sounded like this extraordinary That's utopian project. Quite thought, an undertaking, that would be. Yeah, and I thought, oh, shoot, you know, I need to have, like, read everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got on the plane, you know, I was reading, you know, I'd, I'd read at that point, I'd been in Alpine for a while, I'd read quite a few climbing books, but the plane with this enormous duffel bag, like, you know, the like 30 books <laughs> I hadn't read, you know, I was like, I'm going to read all the classics before this panel starts. <laughs> so that was, that was definitely a step forward in my uh, reading education. <laughs> yeah. Are you, are you in the slow readers club? Like, like myself, I, it takes me a while to read a book, but what I try and do is I, I, I try and sort of, immerse myself in it and almost act it out in a way rather than just not skim reading and reading really quickly i not that i ever want to finish the book because whatever i read I, I really really enjoy but are you are you a sort of fast skim reader or um are you in the slow readers club like me well i hope <laughs> i don't skim <laughs> i do read extremely fast okay um which has been really necessary for mm. for my work because you know, some often I, I found that, you know, in order to edit an in-depth feature article that draws on a lot of mountain literature, I really need to know the literature in order to give the writer the right advice. So, yes. you know, I've definitely had a lot of times where it's like, you know, before editing a mountain profile on Nanda Devi, you know, I must have read, you know, two dozen or more books about yeah. the mountain because I, I just needed to know everything that was out there so I could really be helpful to Pete Takeda who was writing the article. Yeah, um, okay. But yeah, I, did, I have developed a tendency to read fast. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, because I've just read a, I've just read a couple actually that funny you should say about Nanda Devi is they've got a couple. I've got an Eric Shipton book where he first breaks through into the sanctuary of Nanda Devi oh, yeah. for the first time with Bill Tillman, and also in one of my other episodes with Scott Ellsworth. He's got a section in Nanda Devi as well, and I didn't know anything about it before then. Um, I'd heard of it, but didn't know that there was like um, almost like a, not a secretive place, but like a Shangri-La dreamland sort of place that no one's ever been to. Um, but I found that really interesting and I didn't know anything about that. But there's obviously more books about there. Like you say, there's there's so many just on that one particular mountain to not keep up with everything, but to select key ones because there's, there's so many. Yeah, definitely. Um... Yeah. Yeah, I love I love Eric Shipton's writing. Um, I mean, there's there's so much I love I love the section of the Nanda Devi Sanctuary. Um, as another British writer, Hugh Thompson um, described in yep. his own book on Nanda Devi, you know that notion of the sanctuary as this kind of Shangri La, as you described it, you know this sort of hidden garden that you have to go through this That's it, yes. narrow maze like gorge to reach. Um, you know, it is this kind of paradigm of of a notion of earthly paradise that occurs again and again in mountain literature. Um, it, it speaks to something that's like profoundly embedded, I think in our unconscious um, as well as in our conscious desires when we go to the mountains. Um, and certainly yeah. that was something I talked a lot about in my own book. You wrote Imaginary Peaks, The Risenstein Hoax and Other Mountain Dreams. It's been out about, I'd say about 18 months now. Well, coming up to 18 months, I think it was sort of October 21, wasn't it, I believe? Yeah, um, that's right. How has the book been received by the climbing and non-climbing world? My guess is that most people who have read it are climbers. Um, you know, I think, um, yeah, I mean, people, I've gotten a lot of positive reviews, so that's been really encouraging. I think my favourite kind of reception has been um, the people who have said that it's inspired them to do their own writing. Uh, some writers of climbing fiction um who have drawn on ideas from the book as they've written their okay. own book about imaginary mountains which was really exciting for me um, okay i've also i also heard from a fantasy writer who i don't think is a climbing writer at all who um, found useful material there so fantastic because it, it was it had a special jury mention didn't it in banff in 22 yeah, it did. how did that make you feel was it was it great to get that sort of accolade Oh yeah, definitely, and especially from Banff because that place yeah. is so close to my heart. Um, okay. Yeah, I uh, I attended the uh, Mountain and Wilderness Writing Program in two thousand and five there. Yeah. Okay. And then for a long time, I went almost every year to the Banff Mountain Book and Film Festival, and um, you know, I love I love the community there. Um, yeah. I love the mountains there, and um, so yeah, it was it was really meaningful to get that i'd love i'd love to go there one day i'm sure i'll get there at some point yeah i hope you i mean you would love the festival it's a it's a yeah. great place to be a, a reader and a writer we'll now take a quick drinks break and get back to the show after this ad are you tired of drinking your morning coffee out of boring plain mugs look no further than climbing on the bookshelf climbing mugs the mugs are designed with the avid climber in mind. With the show's unique design, you can show off your love for climbing literature and the podcast at the same time. Whether you're sitting down and listening to Climbing on the Bookshelf, a pro climber or just starting out, my mugs are the perfect addition to your collection of climbing gear. So why settle for a boring mug when you can have a Climbing on the Bookshelf podcast-inspired one? Order yours today and take your coffee, tea or hot chocolate game to the next level. See the link in the show notes or head over to Instagram at Climb Bookshelf where there's a link in the bio. Happy drinking. And now, back to the show. So what was it that gave you the motivation or inspiration to write your first book? And could you tell me what the book is about? Yeah, I mean... I've wanted to write books ever since I was seven years old. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> it's funny because I originally dreamed of being a fantasy writer and I think I was just too inhibited. <laughs> so then here I go and I, I go out and I write a nonfiction book about fantasy, um, which is always fun to describe to people. You know, they said, well, what did you write your book about? And I say, imaginary peaks. And they're like, oh, so it's a novel. And I was like, no, no, it's a, it's a real book about 
real imaginary peaks that people really <laughs> thought really existed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I think the, the most pragmatic answer about how I came to write it was that um, my publisher, Mountaineers, uh, approached me and said they were interested in working with me on a book project. And I mentioned that I'd been a couple of ideas, including this one about the Riesenstein hoax that I'd been really interested in ever since uh, 2011, when I first did some research and wrote a short article on it. And they said, that sounds great. <laughs> so write us a book proposal. And so I wrote the book proposal and they accepted it. And all of a sudden I had agreed to write a book while working in 80, 90 hour a week job. <laughs> okay. Crikey. Actually, that <laughs> was one of my questions. Seven very intense years. <laughs> yeah. That was one of my questions I've got written down is whether you approached them or, or they got wind of you writing something and they got in touch. That's what I'd, I'd, I would have liked to know, but you've just answered that for me. So thank you. But yeah, I mean, how I got interested in the story itself, you know, I first yeah. heard about the Riesenstein hoax when I read um, Andy Selter's book on North American mountaineering, Ways to the Sky, and there's a few paragraphs in there devoted to the hoax. And yeah. I mean, to me, it seems so extraordinary, this idea of, you know, imaginary mountains and, you know, the fact that some climbers fell for the hoax in the 1960s, you know, who would have thought that you could still be creating places that didn't exist on the maps as late as then so yeah. i i wanted to learn more about it and decided i was going to write an article about it for alpinist and at the time um the of the three men involved in the hoax harvey manning edward la chapelle and austin post austin was the only one who was still alive so i reached out to him and we did a short interview by wow. um, so i got some of the basics and Sadly, not that long after Austin passed away. So, um, you know, I'd kind of put beyond writing that short piece for Alpinist, I put the idea on hold for a while, but I was still really haunted by it and really wanted to dig deeper into the story and learn more about the people who created it, learn more about the people who fell for it, learn more about the people who found the real mountains that the imaginary mountains were based on and just kind of understand that larger notion of why it is that we're so drawn to these legendary mythic or imaginary peaks in the first place. Okay. With the the book title story, I guess it must have been really easy to convince people that it supposedly discovered these peaks and they just took him at his word because there was no satellite imaging or internet or anything like that. It was just maps with kind of a bit of blank space on them, I guess. Yeah, um, Austin Post had taken photos of the Kachatnas in Alaska. Yeah, which at the time, no climbers had been to. Um, obviously, indigenous people knew about them. Uh, white explorers had been to them back in the 19th century. Um, hunters saw them when they passed through the area. But mountaineers hadn't yet climbed in these peaks, and very few even knew of their existence. So I think that was kind of part of what inspired the idea of the hoax in the first place was you know, Austin and his friends Edward LaChapelle and Harvey Manning were looking at these photos and there were these extraordinary rock spires rising from a, a glacier. I mean, it yeah. looked like something out of a fantasy. Hmm. And they thought, oh, you know, wouldn't it be kind of fun to <laughs> create this fake story behind them and, and pass it off as real? You know, they, they deliberately, you know, I think the choice of claiming that these peaks existed in, in British Columbia near Prince Rupert was a clever one. That was an area that also was not particularly well explored by climbers, so that, again, Indigenous people lived there, explore, other explorers had been there. Um, and there were still some genuine blanks on um, some of the maps of Canada. So, you know, it's uh, Glenn Woodsworth, who was one of the first Canadian climbers to do some serious exploration in that area, um, sent me a map of British Columbia. And you see like these sort of blank orange spaces where it says relief data incomplete. <laughs> so yeah, you know, they were able to pull it off. Um, yeah. For short, you know, people did, you know, American climbers particularly because some it was published in some of the American magazine were particularly interested in going there and they started writing to their friends in Canada. They started writing to uh, Canadian map offices for maps and it became relatively soon. It became clear that the, any peaks like the Kajamas did not actually exist there. Although there were other mountains there that were um, also appealing in their own way. Yeah. Um, 
so then that kind of set off this hunt for the real peaks and you know it really wasn't you know as far as i could tell from my research it wasn't until around 1964 that um two groups of climbers uh simultaneously and and probably separately um figured out that these were in fact the kachatnas and began planning expeditions to go there okay okay what was their motivation of of making this thing up was it just the the kudos of of discovering new mountains i mean i think there were a variety of motivations um when i talked to austin he you know sort of basically just said oh, it was a great joke um <laughs> When uh, I spoke with Dale Cole, who was a friend of Harvey Manning's and had been involved in some of Harvey's other hoaxes, because it turned out these weren't the only peaks that Harvey had invented. Uh, he actually had a history of doing this. Um, and Dale told me that Harvey was deliberately trying to convey a series of messages about the direction he felt the mountaineering world was headed in the late 50s and early 1960s after World War II you know, that he, that Harvey felt that mountaineers had become too obsessed with self-promotion. Um, he <laughs> wasn't particularly happy with the rise of the outdoor industry and the fact that gear was suddenly much more technological and much more expensive, which seemed to be excluding people who weren't able to afford it, um, couldn't go out into the wilderness without it. Um, and yeah, I mean, he was also sort of grumpy about the whole idea <laughs> of claiming mountains as your own, as claiming first ascent. So there was this notion, I think, with the imaginary, with uh, the Riesenstein hoax was like, oh, I'm going to create these non-existent peaks and then I'm going to just sort of sit back and laugh while peak baggers go out looking for them <laughs> on this wild goose chase. And, yeah, and sure. maybe they'll realize how ridiculous they are. Um, so it's round about that. they'll realize sort of... how ridiculous that whole idea of, you know, putting your name on a first ascent is. Yeah, so it's round about the same sort of time as that Yosemite really kicked off. Um is that I guess people were looking a bit further afield and that maybe sort of played into that. It definitely did. I mean, the timing for that particular kind of mountain to be appealing to American climbers was perfect. Um, it yeah. was right yeah. around the time that Yvonne Chouinard was working on his manifesto that was later published in 1963 about Yosemite climbing and this notion that Yosemite climbers had trained on the big walls of California, and now they were going to take these abilities and these skills and these techniques and apply them to the great granite ranges of the world, you know, and, yep. and here's the reason sign, you know, these great granite ranges in some remote perfect fit. Yes. snowy location. It was a perfect fit for what climbers were wanting to do. So yeah, it was sort of this, this something that was like just on the edge of the possible in terms of people's skills then. Yeah. Which, which is an ideal thing in a climber's mind to aim for yeah definitely um your book's not just about that particular hoax it's got other stories in it too could you tell me how you came to include those particular ones and leave others out yeah it was you know the more that i started digging into the history the more i realized that these that imaginary mountains existed everywhere then it was a question of you know well i can't you know i, I basically to write a complete history of imaginary mountains would be to basically rewrite the history of the world because <laughs> you know every region has their own stories um so it was it became a matter of selection and you know i would still after the book came out I'd pe people would be like oh why didn't you write about this or why didn't you write about that and i was like well this yeah. book was already bursting at the seams as it um but yeah i, I chose I chose mountains, um, you know, I talk about this a little bit in the author's note that, you know, I chose mountains that I felt either had directly inspired Harvey Manning as he came up with the idea of the reason yep. sign. Um, and I knew that from reading his published and unpublished manuscripts at the University of Washington. So I paid attention to which imaginary mountains he talked about in his own work, which hoaxes he focused on. Um, and then I also looked at the stories that inspired, um, the climbers who set out to solve the hoax. And so that was kind of, that was really what directed my choice was looking at the kind of the history that fed into this particular hoax. Now I know a little bit more about the book. Would it be okay if you could maybe do a reading from it? Yeah, um, would um, that, would that be okay? Is that, is that allowed? Yes. <laughs> so there's two passages I could read. Um, yeah, fantastic. And I can do them both yeah. if you like. Yeah, um, that'd be lovely. Yeah, thank you. Um, they're short, but I thought that this might be good because they sort of describe 
they set up really kind of what the book's about. Oh, perfect. Um, Lovely. So just as a, by way of introduction that, you know, as I was digging into all this research, I began realizing, you know, that underlying the history of exploration and mountaineering, that there was this other history of legends, dreams, errors, mirages, and outright hoaxes that resulted in the creation of hundreds of mythic or imaginary peaks across the centuries and around the world. And, you know, I think this notion to me of these vanishing ranges from maps became incredibly appealing. Um, but um, to focus just on the reason sign, um, so I'm going to read a passage that um, talks about the appearance of the hoax itself and people's initial reactions to it, sort of a, an introduction to the book. Um, and uh, yeah, so here it goes. In June 1962, readers of Summit Magazine opened its pages to an intriguing photo of a seemingly unknown range. The mountains in the black and white image were unlike any that most American climbers had ever seen before. Sheer rock cliffs rose to intricate ridges and spires, stacked one above the other, thousands of feet high, like the ramparts of an extraterrestrial city. White light poured through roiling clouds, flashing off patches of ice and snow and burnishing the rock to silver. Cracks splintered at flying buttresses of stone, hinting to a climber's eye of pathways to crenellated skylines. Glimpses of hanging glaciers and dark shadows suggested a landscape that was cold, remote, and stormy, a stark contrast to the sun-drenched Yosemite Valley where California climbers had begun to confront steep, giant walls only a few years before. Yet this unfamiliar range, with its aura of old, forgotten dreams, seemed just at the edge of the possible. Despite the surreal appearance of the mountains, the photo caption located them in an accessible, though isolated, place. The unclimbed summit of Riesenstein, approximately 8,100 feet, near Prince Rupert in British Columbia. It can be reached in two days by bushwhacking up the Kaladi River. Who will be the first to climb it? The picture was accompanied by an unattributed article about three intrepid Austrians, Mackler, Bisserlich, and Kronifer, who thrashed through ancient forests as they followed the Nass River to its confluence with the Kaladi, and then pressed on ever deeper into an unmapped wild. Atop a high coal, the three men gazed at a vast glacier that flowed towards the Skeena River. Overhead, the fortress walls of the unfamiliar peaks must have blocked out the sky. The narrator summarized their subsequent adventures in a short note. But the photo had already stirred readers' imaginations, and mountaineers were easily tempted to fill in gaps in the terse prose with their own daydreams. For their first climb, the Austrians scampered to the top of the nearest low peak, its small turrets half hidden by the larger spires. From this summit, they would have stared, mesmerized and bewildered at the views. Countless potential routes must have unfolded around them a dense maze guarded by mysterious citadels of rock, ice, and snow. Their next objective was more ambitious, an attempt on what appeared to be the apex of the range. They crept into the shade of an immense dark wall below an ice-capped tower. A hanging glacier loomed high above. Avalanches burst from its edges and exploded down the cliff. Afraid to venture farther, the Austrians turned back. In search of a safer option, the trio teetered up a broken ridge line toward the top of another dome. Twice they found the terrain too difficult to ascend with just their hands and feet, so they tugged on gear they jammed into fissures in the rock. At last they attained the threshold where the white of the summit snows blurred into the white of the clouded sky. Back down on the glacier, the emboldened group plotted another attempt on the crest of the tallest peak. As the Austrians traversed a swath of pleated stone, clouds enveloped them. They huddled on a rocky perch for what was probably a miserable night of wind and snow before deciding to retreat. The blizzard must have lasted a long while, since the story picked up a month later when the Austrians crossed the avalanche hazard zone yet again to try to climb the ice-capped tower. More clouds blew in as they reached a glistening rock face. About 150 to 200 feet high, this cliff seemed to be the last serious obstacle between the three men and the apex of the range. 
Bisserlik attempted to clamber over it, only to fall and rip out two of the pitons he pounded into a crack. Caught by the rope, he suffered only minor injuries. Discouraged, the climbers headed down for the final time, while the sky darkened with storm. It was the end of the expedition. The Austrians had ascended two of the smaller peaks, but failed to summit the highest, most coveted one. Nonetheless, they believed that someone could get up that last wall by drilling bolts into the rock. Traced across their photo, a series of white dotted lines, with wide spaces between them, showed that the Austrians' ascents and attempts had covered only a fragment of the pathways up this vertical labyrinth. On another page, a sketched map included hatch marks that suggested sharp summits. Striped blobs designated four unnamed glaciers. Arrows indicated the Kaladi and the Skena rivers. The words unexplored area were scrawled across the top left corner of the page. During a century when airplanes flew around the globe, these mysterious spires had somehow remained unnoticed, a blank on modern maps. So as I mentioned to you, when I started researching the history behind the hoax, I spoke with Dale Cole and uh, he told me that there were actually multiple hoaxes. <laughs> and one <laughs> of them, which is the one, um, the no name peak hoax I discovered was still fooling people as late as I think it was around 2019 when I was okay. doing research on it. And I, I reached out to some historians and I was like, so I want to talk to you about the no name peak hoax. And they're like, wait, that's a hoax. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that was, that was fun, although a little bit embarrassing. Um, <laughs> this was, this is the one I'm passage going to read now um, is from a different hoax. It's the sleeping system hoax. And this is okay. the first, known hoax of Harvey's that um, was published in Summit Magazine um, before the no name Peak hoax and the Riesenstein hoax. And as you'll see from the passage, Harvey thought of the sleeping system hoax as practice for bigger and better things. So here we go. To understand Harvey and his hoaxes, Dale Cole told me, people needed to understand the burgeoning outdoor industry at the cusp of the 1960s. We saw the climbing culture itself change, Dale said. New manufacturers moved into the scene and they were selling their materials for prices that we thought were cruel and high. There was another breed of climber who took climbing far more seriously. Not that we didn't do serious climbing, but it wasn't a question of bragging about it in an arrogant way. Well, Harvey was particularly put out by this kind of climber, especially their accounts of accomplishments in climbing journals and magazines, depictions that made an ascent more of an ego trip than a climbing trip. As you well know, climbing dates and climbing facts and bragging rights and exaggerations come up in articles submitted to climbing magazines and misrepresent what's really there. Harvey himself said, facts and fiction read the very same way in print. On August 1st, 1959, Harvey wrote to his friend Ted Beck detailing plans for his first known prank on the gear industry. Incidentally, Harvey announced in his letter, I'll be calling on you shortly to take a proper part in the great hoax. While down at the REI co-op in June, I picked up a copy of Summit Magazine and the thing irritated me, especially all the pseudo scholarly crap about sleeping bag research. So I wrote a long circumstantial letter to the editor describing a research project being carried on by the Cougar Mountaineers, of which I, H. Hawthorne Manning, am president. Dale Cole is gonna follow up with some correct and further research as chairman of the Sleeping System Committee. Ideally, we hope dullards from all over the country are taken in and start criticizing the system. We can then answer them, having the tremendous advantage that we can invent all the necessary research and statistics while they will be dependent on fact. Actually, this is proposed merely as a test. The experience should prove useful for a later hoax, unplanned, involving the American Alpine Club. Maybe we could discover a new climbing area in the Cascades, the Crazy Creek Crags, Crazy Creek, is a third tributary on the left of the blank river. This has to be a real river. We would need a real climbing party like Becky Manning and Cole. Stand ready to take action, but keep it quiet since only about four people are in on the thing. It's a very promising lead. Might in the long run be possible to destroy the whole sport of climbing. Yours for mutual self-destruction, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So that's an actual letter that Harvey Manning wrote. You can find that's it incredible. in the university. <laughs> of Washington 
um, archives. And <laughs> when I came across this letter, when I was doing my research, I was like, I cannot believe I have this. <laughs> you know, it's like you think about all the other researchers researching other hoaxes and, you know, you can never really prove it. You know, it's like, you yeah. know, people researching, you know, Frederick Cook or something. And, you know, uh -huh. here it's like Harvey Manning, like detailed his entire hoax in his, in his correspondence, you know, all his plots <laughs> are there. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh, that was absolutely amazing. A real treat, that was. Thank you so much for doing that for me. I've said it on another episode before that there's something really nice about an author reading from their own book and you get to kind of hear how they wrote it. Um, so thank you for that. It was really special. Oh, thanks. That's what I'm hoping that that's inspired more people to go and buy the book. Um, so where can people pick up or order it from or is there a preferred online shop for you is there an actual shop you can walk into and pick the book up where would you like people to buy it from or can they just get it from anywhere um it, i have seen it for sale in some actual shops um like you know some climbing shops have it um sure randomly it's on display in the vancouver airport um, okay <laughs> but Probably the easiest way, thing is to buy it online. Um, if you want to support my publisher, Mountaineers, they're a nonprofit publisher and they like take chances on uh, authors with eccentric book topics. Like sure, myself. yeah. yeah. Um, so they could use the support. Um, so they're you know, based in directly. Seattle, aren't they? Yeah, so buying yeah, it directly yeah. from their website um, is great. Um, it's also available you know, anywhere that you would buy a book online, Barnes & Nobles, Amazon, Powell's. Sure. Um, if you're in the UK, uh, yep. Heather Da of, has a site called Little Peak. She's selling copies of Imaginary Peaks there, among other books. So okay, that's one yeah. way of it. And I think Corday is selling it too uh, in the UK. So um, that's another way of doing it. And at the beginning, you said that you were writing another book. If so, um, is it a mountain literature one or is it something completely different like a murder mystery? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I'm doomed to write about nothing but mountains. I, you know, I, I try to branch out a little bit. Like I've written, uh, occasionally written stories about hiking, you know, like okay. that's, that's a step away from climbing. You yeah. Know, that's not quite climbing. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I'm working on a book that's uh, about real mountains. So I went from imaginary mountains to real ones. To real so. ones this time. Okay. Yeah. So do you know what that's called yet? Or have you got a working title or? Can you, would you rather not say at the moment? I'd rather keep it to myself for now. Okay. Uh, okay. I do have a publisher, so I'm I'm definitely uh, trying to make progress. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I hope all that that goes well for you. Oh, thanks. Is there anything else that you think people should know about yourself or um, that I haven't asked? I mean, I guess. You know, maybe I think like like a lot of writers out there, you know, I think what's foremost on my mind in terms of, you know, the future of mountain literature is the need for readers to support it. Um, you know, and yeah. I think if people really care about long form journalism, if they care about immersive storytelling, if they care about creative writing about climbing, um, you know, that this, we're really at a time where these genres need support more than ever um because you know if all you're doing is consuming branded content on social media at a certain point that's all there is going to be to consume um yeah so yeah i guess it's just just a plea for for people to uh you know continue to support magazine and book publishers I yeah suppose. okay that's, that's, a, that's a good one to to mention yeah um well thank you so much katie for for giving me some of your precious time and coming on the on the podcast I really appreciate it and I really enjoyed talking with you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking with you too. Thanks Thank so much you. for inviting me.